All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lower Third Podcast. I'm super excited about our guest today. Uh, We are going to do a deep dive on real estate, grit, perspective, resilience, determination, all that good stuff. Uh, The goal of the show is to introduce you to the people and ideas who are pushing the envelope, making shit happen, and just really going out there and creating opportunity, especially during a pandemic uh, or anytime, any recession, anytime when things are a little bit off kilter. So uh, hopefully this will give you a little bit of insight today, a little bit of uh, optimism, maybe a little pep in your step to get you through the next day and start thinking about what the future looks like. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here today with Jerome Myers of the Myers Development Group. Uh, And so I'm very excited to welcome you on the show. Thank you for taking time to do this with me today. Uh, how's, How's your world today, Jerome? Amazing. Thanks for asking, Molly. Yeah, man. I love that shirt. (laughs) <laughs> red pill, baby. You got to take it. You got to choose, right? You I mean, want... what was the difference between the red pill and the blue pill? I don't remember. Uh, the red pill was about tr- truth, right? So oh. Morpheus offered Neo the truth. He said, if you want to, if you take the red pill, you'll go down the rabbit hole and you'll understand the truth and know the truth as it is and not what we see as the matrix was presented to us. And so it's my desire to live in truth just really fully embrace myself and the world that I'm in. So it's kind of like eating a lot of LSD or doing like ayahuasca, right? You're like, I'm going down the rabbit hole, but I'm going to learn the truth about myself and the planet that I'm on. So um, I can dig it. I mean, truth be told, I watched The Matrix and didn't understand it. You know, I really try. I think I watched it twice and I was like, I don't know. Although I feel like I lived that life intuitively, but like I still, I was just like, yeah, computers, zeros, ones. I don't know, man. What are you going to do? No, it's a documentary. <laughs> you got to go back and watch it. You're in a different place in life now. It's been like 20 years. Like you got to go back and watch it. It's amazing. I promise. That's true. You know, I'll have to give it a, another spin. Lord knows I've got some some room on the Netflix queue for something, you know, to watch. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, um, you know, I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today. I'm really glad that you agreed to do it. I know that uh, you, we hadn't met before today. And so I appreciate you trusting in, in the process a little bit here. Uh, I know you have a real estate background while well, you were working full time. You made that jump to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you did your first like big apartment deal. Uh, and then, you know, that's kind of snowballed from there. And I know you spend a lot of time. I love your tagline of like developing people and places and, and things like that. I think it's uh, really important. And so I'm just kind of curious, you know, um, you know, was real estate something that you were always interested in? Uh, you know, how did you, how did you make that, you know, leap? And did you have like a mentor? Did you have somebody kind of guiding you or are you just like, I'm just doing it and it's just going to what happened? If I was smart, I would have had somebody guiding me, but I didn't. I did it through the school of hard knocks and it was the most inefficient and ineffective way to get that thing done. Right. So I went to podcast university and I did self-study with books and YouTube videos and we got the first deal done, but it wasn't without a bunch of stomping your toe and hitting your head on stuff. So, you know, I tell everybody now that I'm on the other side of this, that I absolutely should got a coach and my business will probably be three or four times the size that it is today had I went down that path. Yeah, I can dig it. I mean, you know, real estate is a complicated thing. I was a loan processor and a loan officer. I spent 13 years in real estate finance. And, uh, you know, it's nothing but problems and you got to figure out how to problem solve, which is what I really loved about it. I loved being able to check those boxes and get people to do things that they normally wouldn't do, like getting, you know, Bank of America to fill out that verification of deposit at 630 on a Friday night, because you know that family's going to lose their earnest money deposit if we don't get it, get that loan approved. And, and just like understanding that, you know, anything really is possible. But if you, if you're not willing to problem solve, right, then, then the deal doesn't happen. It just, that's just what it is. Cause there's always problems and every deal has its own set of problems that are unique to the last deal. So no, no matter how many deals you do, you're still going to run into unique problems that you've never faced before. Uh, which is one of the things that I really loved about real estate, to be honest. I, I, I'm a, I love solving problems. That's my jam. Yeah. I mean, I think every entrepreneur is in the business of solving problems, right, Molly? It doesn't matter whether you're doing real estate or something else. And so what I encourage people to do is to work that muscle because the more that you work that muscle, the better you are at solving those problems. And so I I agree with you. And I think the level of compensation that anybody has is really tied to 
uh, the type, the size of the problem they're solving, right? So if you're solving a problem for a person, then you get compensated based on what a person can solve. And we were talking a little bit before we started recording, right? You solve problems for businesses. And so you get compensated for solving a bigger problem. And, you know, in theory, you're going to get paid more for solving those bigger problems because you have more impact or influence. Makes sense. So with everything going on with the pandemic, how has that impacted your business? Are you still able to do investing? Are you still working? Like, you know, how, how has this impacted you? Yeah, we did some pivots and we really started focusing on digital or virtual connections and really building the LinkedIn platform out because we were there before, but we weren't there in a really strong way. And so, you know, if you go back before 2019, you couldn't find me online anywhere. You couldn't find any pictures of me, maybe one from when I was in college. But outside of that, I was pretty much a ghost. And so we've really drove that point home and really solidified our presence on LinkedIn, do a little bit on Instagram, but really just making sure that people get to know us because, you know, the business that I'm in is really focused on people knowing, liking, and trusting you. Mm -hmm. Most people say that trust is the most important, but if people don't know who you are, then they can't ever trust you, right? right? They can't, they like you. And then the like piece goes into trust. And so, you know, really focusing on going to scale there. And then are we able to still do deals? Yes and no. So I've had a few deals fall apart, if I'm totally frank, right? I thought we were going to do some stuff and investor sentiment changed. And so people didn't want to participate in new deals, but we already had stuff in the pipeline. And so really doubling down on making sure that we're operating those things well and just trying to create or generate a result that is different than what a lot of other people are doing. For the business that I'm in, a lot of people are focused on finding deals and raising money. It's the sexy part of the business. Uh, But over the course of six months, you do that. The next 60 months is when you actually make the money in the project or the property. And you know, nobody wants to talk about it because it's not sexy. It's kind of the grind of tenants, toilets and trash. And so right. if you're not doing that stuff, well, you're not going to make any big money on your exit. And more often than not, that's when the big payday is. Mm. So these uh, apartment deals that you've done, like how many units are in these apartments? Yeah. So around 20, you know, we look for stuff that's under 50 generally Mm -hmm. because we like that space. We call them midsize apartments. Uh, We'll look at stuff up to, let's say, 100. We've got a development deal that we're working on. It's 120 here in Greensboro. But, you know, the stuff that we bought to reposition early on, it was a lot of proof of concept. Right. So let me buy this. Let me see how rents go. Let me see if I make this change or that change. What will it do to the property? What type of residents are we attracting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then once you go through and kind of get your minimal viable product and understand what your strategy needs to look like, get pricing on the different parts and pieces that go into the business plan, you can ratchet that and, and go to the next level. And so that's what we've been doing. And so now the goal is to go to scale. And so we're looking to go to a thousand units here in Greensboro. Man, that's crazy. So how long do you own these properties typically? And so you buy them and then you're also managing them or are you hiring another company to manage that or... What does that look like? Yeah, so we outsource the property management. We, we use third party and we'll probably continue to do that until we're in the four or 500 unit range. And then we'll go vertically integrated because it's just a different business model. And the ability to control the resource is super important. But at this juncture, we think it's really efficient for us to outsource that piece of it. And we buy things to hold them for forever. Now, if somebody comes in and they yeah, want it sure. more than we do, we'll sell it to them. But we have a model where we'll put the money in and then we'll execute the business plan, refinance, pull all of our original capital back out. And then we have that capital to go do another deal while we continue to cash flow the property that we currently own. So you're just keeping it rolling. So how many uh, apartment deals have you done now? We're the, we've done five. We've done five with the new development being our six, but we still haven't broke ground on that. So I don't count it yet. And would you, has that been impacted at all by the pandemic? Has that been slowed down with that construction uh, rollout or? 
No, I think it's just always a slow process. What with that project, you know, it's just been kind of slow overall. And it, you got to when you're when you're doing, you know, a 17 to 20 million dollar project, you got to pick your partners pretty wisely. Right. And so we we took our time and I think we found one of the most reputable and trustworthy and honest teams in the city to work with. And, you know, that's really important for me because, you know, the first experience is always going to be the one that kind of sets the tone for how things go in the future. And so how big is your company? How many people are involved? And do you do the deals with the same people all the time? Or do you work with different investors? Or how, what is that? How's that shake out? So every property is its own partnership. Right. Mm-hmm. So of the five deals that we talked about, we have multiple partners. Some people re- repartner in various deals. Uh, we we outsource everything. Right. So that we're just responsible for managing the different companies versus having employees. Uh, for the listeners who don't have the privilege of my story, the part of the reason why I left corporate America was I got to lay people off two years in a row and I just didn't enjoy that process. And so for me, there's a pretty big difference between, you know, somebody coming into the company and you deciding, Hey, I don't like the way that this person's performing. We're going to let them go versus being able to work with the company and say, Hey, this person isn't giving us what we need. We'd like to have a different resource allocated to the properties that we're working with. That makes a lot of sense. It, it's it's definitely difficult to let people go. I know, um, you know, during this pandemic, a lot of people have been, you know, fired from their jobs or let go. And uh, as difficult as it as it is for the employees, it's really hard for the employer too, which I, I'm, I'm positive a lot of people don't really think about unless they've actually been an employer. Uh, it's it's a tough place to be in. So, um, so what does everything kind of look like for you moving forward? This has this pandemic slowed down, you know, future deals? Is, are people being a little squirrely right now, just kind of waiting to see what will happen? Or do you, because, you know, from the outside looking in, it looks like real estate is still moving forward. I see people selling houses. I see virtual real estate. I mean, those are smaller deals, obviously. And people need, need, still need some place to live. You know, but I'm just curious, like, are people less interested in living in large apartment buildings now because of the pandemic? Like, do you think that'll impact impact, you know, the work that you're doing? Or do you think it, no matter what in cities, they're still going to be necessary and it just is what it is? I think there will be some apprehension in the cities where there's buildings that have elevators. Fortunately for us, everything we own is garden style. So people Mm. walk out into an open space. So it's not like there's a confined space that they're trapped in with other folks. Uh, With the real estate in general, I think fundamentally things were fine. Right. And so the pandemic is health related. It's not economic related. It becomes economic. There becomes economic impact on the backside of it. But fundamentally, that's not the driver for this. And so I don't know where the people are going to go if they don't live where they've been living. There's but so much consolidation that's going to happen. And yes, the big question mark is, well, can they pay their rent? And I think eventually, yes, they will be able to pay their rent. Now, how long that takes, I I don't know. How much government support will get along the way, I I don't know. But just fundamentally, the number of people versus the number of households that are available for those people to live in hasn't dramatically changed. And so with that being said, there are some states where people are leaving that are really high cost, like California. But, you know, in North Carolina and Virginia, the cost of living isn't super high. And I would suspect that a lot of people are probably migrating to those types of states versus the other ones. And so it makes me feel really good about where we're positioned and how we're positioned. And I think the other thing is for the people who are impacted economically, who may be in a home today, they're going to be looking to move into some form of apartment or townhome or something like that. And that's where we're positioned. And so we're welcoming those folks with open arms. So is your is there a particular demographic that you go after? Is it like affordable housing or is it luxury housing? Is there or is every project different based on the opportunity? 
Yeah. So we like workforce housing. And what does that mean? That means teachers, police officers, firefighters, you know, those folks that make the world go around, they really operate it. They don't have a ton of income, right? But they are should have a nice place to live. And that's mm-hmm. what we're looking for. So we're taking the stuff that was built in the 60s, 70s and 80s and rehabbing it and bringing it up to 2015, 2018 standards. So those folks can move in and enjoy a really nice building even though, you know, the bones are pretty old. You know, that's a you know really important point because in Washington, D.C., because of the housing prices, uh, most of the local government lives in Maryland. Uh-huh. And, and there's a real problem there when you are not, uh, if you don't live in the community that you're supposed to be servicing and protecting and everything else, and there's a huge disconnect there. And it makes it really difficult for people to do their jobs effectively uh, in, a, in, a, in a positive way. Uh, and so we see a lot of problems with that in DC where it's like, you know, of course you don't know the neighborhood. You live in PG. You live... 45 minutes from here. So you're not invested and your kids aren't going to those schools and you don't shop in those grocery stores. So um, it's a little different, right? And so it'll be interesting to see. I know like in DC, I think there'll be an exit as I think commercial real estate is going to change for sure. Um, You know, downtown rents were just way too expensive, um, just offensively expensive. And so I think there's going to be some movement. But then at the core, right, we, you know, we talk a lot about gentrification, but we rarely talk about displacement, right, which is really you know, that's really the biggest issue. I mean, who doesn't want better schools and nicer parks as long as the same people get to stay you know, who, who were there when it wasn't so great. They should be able to stay and pay the same amount of money. And that's not what happened. So who knows? Maybe this will be like a different kind of a turn. Maybe this will help kind of slow some of that down. It'll treat the people that are from that area a little better and give them some opportunities to be someplace they can afford and be close to home and not have to commute and not be so disconnected. Um, because I think at the core, it really harms a city when the, when the, when the people who run it aren't, aren't living there. Without question, without question, I think any vacancy or um, empty housing turns into a place of crime more often than not. Right. Mm -hmm. People are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And that is troubling for me because I want cities and communities to be safe. I think that's probably one of the most important things that people strive for and desire in America. You know, a lot of the other countries in the world have really high crime rates and we have a pretty safe country and Mm -hmm. we want more of that. So I I think you're spot on with that for sure. So, you know, when you're doing these huge deals and you got millions of dollars on the table, you ever just like freak out a little bit, man? You ever have like sleepless nights where you just like, you just lay in bed and your heart's pounding and you're just thinking to yourself, like, what am I doing? Like, what about my children? I don't even know if you have children, but I'm just going to assume, you know, uh, you know, how to, do do you ever let that win? Do you look at that as like, maybe the universe is telling me to pay attention or are you just like, nah, brain, not today. Uh, You know, does that happen to you? Cause I'm stressed a little bit for you with millions of dollars of projects going on. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny, right? We will sign a million dollar loan and it's just like, ah, okay. Another one. Right. Like, what are you going to do? And move when, to Costa Rica in the middle of the night, <laughs> it doesn't work out. <laughs> no, unfortunately that's not the, the answer for us. But yeah, so the kid question, yeah, I've got two girls. They're eight and 10 and oh, wow. they're my favorite people in the world. But, you know, outside of that piece of it, I, I, I did choke a few times. It's like, what in the world am I doing? Right. Because who thinks about signing a million dollar loan? And it's a, like a personal guarantee. And okay, so what happens if I can't pay the bill? And and if I go back to my first deal, right, Molly, I, had I been able to do that deal on my own, I would be bankrupt today, right? So the the deal went over budget and was over schedule. And had I just been relying on the money that I had available to me, I would have been in the tank because I wouldn't have enough money to get through the project. And so you've got to make sure that you partner with people that have resources. And for somebody who's a son of a soldier and a stay at home mom, the thought that, Hey, you can go spend a million dollars here or a million dollars there. Or in one case we're you know, we're spending 17 to $20 million on another one. It's just like, 
how do you wrap your mind around that? And I think it's really a function of who you spend time with. I've got a mm-hmm. mentor in Pennsylvania and he owns 2000 units by himself, like no partners, just him. Um, when you add in what his brother and his dad own, they own as a family 4,000 units. I've got another mentor who him and his brother, they own 6,000. And so when you start talking about stuff and those numbers and people are start getting worth hundreds of millions of dollars, it changes the way that you see the world and it expands what you know is possible. And so, you know, for me, it's really about seeking examples of people who are doing what you want to do. And not so much the people at the end of the road, right? So, you know, I I don't need to be where Pan Codge is today, right? I just need to know that that's out there. And maybe I can go talk to somebody who has 100 doors or 500 doors or whatever the number is, because there's milestones that happen along the way. And that's really what we're working towards is that. And I think having those examples combined with coaches is the way that people go to that next level. If you know, if you want to go perform at a really high level and you don't have a coach, you're kidding yourself because you really want somebody who's going to push you, hold you accountable and be the, the connector of people that are performing at those levels. It, mm-hmm. Net worth and network or your network is your net worth is one of those sayings that gets thrown around, but it is absolutely the truth. Do you think that this limited communication and like, you know, social distancing and stuff, do you think that will impact your network moving forward? Or do you think that you have enough roots that you'll continue to, to grow, even if it's, you know, in a different way, right. Than previous. So, you know, we talked a little bit about LinkedIn already, right. And I can tell you that I've met some of the most amazing people through LinkedIn and these virtual meetups. For instance, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, but I got to attend a meetup that's headed by a group in Gaithersburg, Maryland last night. And there's another one this week for a group that's in Texas. There's one tonight by a guy that lives in Israel, but runs a meetup across the U.S. Wow. And we're having people from all over the country coming into a conference that I'm putting on later this month. And so the ability from, I guess it's the efficiency that the internet gives us, even though it's not, we're sitting in the same room, being able to sit across from you, via video chat, it's right. very, very similar. I might not be able to put my skin on your skin, but right. outside of that, I think everything's pretty much the same. I can see your facial expressions. Right. I can see you. And the other thing is it's really personal, right? So you're it putting into your home and yeah. you're in which corner of your home I'm going to see. But nonetheless, I'm inside your home and there's a whole lot of people that we meet that we probably wouldn't invite in. So when we invite them into that intimate space, I think it does a whole lot for um, increasing the level of connection and probably not the level, but the deepness of that connection. I totally agree. And like, especially, you know, um, seeing people's pets or seeing people's, you know, kids and stuff. And you're like, oh yeah, they're, they're a real person, you know? And, you know, you kind of, not that, you know, you don't think they're real, but it's just different when you're networking, you're not thinking about their kids. You're not seeing their kid come on camera and be like, mom, dad, you know? And it it is, it is really personal. Um, And I hear you. I think it's, you know, accessibility is a big thing, right? In a lot of different ways. And so we're blowing the doors off of that because, you know, accessibility means a lot of different things, right? Like access to funding or physically being able to go to some place, right? Like I'm sure there's tons of times we've taken uh, for granted just being able to walk into a building or walk to a meetup where like people with like, you know, uh, disabilities couldn't or people that don't have the money or transportation, right? Like it was, it, it limited a lot of people in a lot of ways that are, you know, very capable, but just not able to do that one thing to get them to the next level. And I think that the, you know, Zoom era is kind of leveled that playing field, right? You know, it's it's about having a good microphone so you don't like wear people out with bad audio all day. But yeah, it's a different type of connection. So so what is this conference uh, that you're doing at the end of the month here? 
Yeah, it's called the Mid Atlantic Multifamily Investing Conference, and we're bringing all my multifamily investor friends into this virtual platform where you'll be able to like pick a table and sit down and have conversations with people at the table. Go over to the deal desk and have one on one conversations there, or go into the auditorium and listen to the speakers give their presentation as we go through about a thirty hour event. So it's going to start at six p.m. on July thirty first, and at noon on August second. And we're sharing a bunch of inspiration and education around multifamily investing. And so got a lot of speakers that most people haven't heard from because they're not the national educators. But the goal for me was to get the people that are somewhere along their journey so that people can connect and say, hey, I'm like Logan or I'm like Pankaj or I'm like Jerome or Duran or James or Kristen or any of the other folks, Tiffany, who are coming in to share their stories on how they made their transitions. And transition is probably a relative word, right? So everybody's at a different juncture and a different Mm -hmm. phase and they're just on the journey somewhere. They've made their progress. That's really cool. So are you doing coaching yourself or is all your business real estate deals? We do some coaching. We help people in the coaching fronts as well. So that's my true passion. I do the real estate, but at the end of the day, I I really, really, really love coaching. I, As a kid, I was able to help somebody realize their dream. And I can't remember exactly what the dream was, but I do remember the feeling. It was as if I got it, right? And so right. when I have coaching clients who grow their income dramatically, even if, you know, I'm only getting my free because I'm not getting a percentage of the growth, it excites me because I get to see the smile on their face or I get to see the fist pump or I get to see whatever the piece of the celebration is. And it does a couple of things for me. Um, In general, my life, my thesis on life is dreams should be real, right? And so every time somebody shares a dream with me and then we go out and manifest it, it confirms my thesis, Right. Right. And then the second piece of what it does is it gives me that dopamine hit because I was with them along the way. I consider myself more of a tour guide than a travel agent. Travel agent tells you where to go. They kind of lay it all out and then they say, I'll see you when you get back. Mm -hmm. Tour guide goes on the journey with you. And I enjoy that piece of it because, you know, I know how difficult it is to birth or labor to bring that baby into the world because I've done it over and over again through reinvention and some of the other things that I've been through. And some people just haven't had that experience and they need somebody to go with them. And I think I'm pretty good at that. And I guess the only other thing that is worth saying on this point is, you know, I think there's a whole lot of people who know what they want to do. They kind of know why. In the how is where they struggle. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, what do I do? What do I do next? And I liken it to solitary. What's your next logical step? You know, this is the outcome, but how do we do the next logical step to get you closer to the goal? And so I'm really good at the how. And it's not so much like I'm this brainiac with this amazing strategy. I just know how to put together a practical solution mm-hmm. and then stay consistent and hold Mm -hmm. people accountable so that they keep walking. And, you know, kind of case in point, like in 2019, I walked 4 million steps, right? It's like, well, how do you count that many steps? Well, got a Fitbit for one, but two, like I just walk every day, right? And so the goal is six miles each day. I, I do more other days, I do less, but at the end of the day, like it all averages out. And so, you know, you, it's really amazing how far you, you can go in a year. It's really amazing how far you can go in three years, right? And it's people underestimate what they can do or they kind of overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in two, three, four, ten. Interesting. I was listening to um, Tim Ferriss just came out with a new book called Tools of the Titans. It just came out uh, June 20th. So I'm super stoked. So I started that today. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, what are your five-year plans and how would you get them done if somebody had a gun to your head and tell you you had six months to accomplish them? And I thought, man, it, you know, I'm sure he didn't write that during the pandemic, but never has that been more of a relevant statement, right? Like how do you accomplish five years worth of goals in the next six months? Because if there was ever a time, right? Um, 
you know, some people are busier, some people aren't, but like we're, we've been given this incredible gift of self-reflection, right? And I think that people are going to be a lot more intentional with their time and their money moving forward. And like, where do you really want to be? Do you want to keep paying a mortgage? Do you want to keep like running this race, which by the way, the race might not even be happening no more because your industry, you know, might have just fallen out, right? Lots of industries are booming. Some industries are disappearing. Some industries are being created, you know? So what does that really look like? And I think it's giving people an opportunity to really like ask themselves that question like do I want to live in a city do I want to grow my own food do I want to teach my kids like what does uh what does life actually really look like so um what is your ideal client like who is you know who would be your favorite type of person or what type of a journey and where would they be on uh, you know for you to be a coach for them my ideal client is somebody that has some form of a technical background or previous experience in business. They've got a pretty clear picture of what they want to accomplish. And when I say a clear picture, I, I kind of think about it in geography because I'm not really in that much that eloquent any other way. Right. So they know that they want to go to Florida out of all the 50 states. They know they want to go to Florida. And so what I would help them do is figure out what city street and then address that they want to go to in Florida. We get super clear about that. And then we go on the process of actually executing it. And why, why do I care about technical or business? Because you've got to sell regardless of what you're doing. There's always going to be some sell to it and you're going to want to use data to inform decisions. Right. And so those two things are what I've spent a lot of time on over the course of my career. And I want other people who can, enjoy that piece of it or want to adopt that piece of it because I don't want it to be a fight. I've worked with people who say, oh, well, my gut says do this. And it's probably a roundabout way to make sure that they fail. And so I want to have people to actually look at the data and make an assessment and then act against the thesis. Yeah, because a lot of times, I mean, it's good to like go with your gut on some level, but data is really important for sure. So are you, you're coaching people, not just in real estate then, like with with life in general, is that correct? I mean, maybe not the like therapy style, but you know, people who have goals and dreams. And now is there like a, uh, you know, monetary amount of goals? You know, is it just somebody, somebody who just wants to like, uh, you know, make 50 grand a year consistently? Is that somebody you want to work with? Or are you kind of looking for people who are really trying to like set the bar and be an outlier? No, I think in order for the people that I can help the most are making over $125,000 a year and not living in a super expensive metro like New York or DC or San Francisco, right? They've got some disposable income that one, they can invest in themselves through coaching, but two, they've got some money that they can put into the endeavor that they're working on. There's nothing mm -hmm. worse than building a great mousetrap, but nobody knows about your mousetrap because you don't have any money to tell people. Right. Yeah. It's like podcasting. I always tell people, this is not the field of dreams, man. Just because you built it does not mean they're coming. You got to let them know. Uh, and it's a noisy, noisy market right now. Well, I've been watching you, um, you know, pop up on LinkedIn, like through other connections and stuff through Maurice, you know, Philogene, shout out to him. Um, and I've definitely seen your like digital imprint has like really grown uh, quite a bit. And so I'm, I'm really happy to see that for sure. Uh, I always like to see people winning and taking big risks because I think, I think we need to see people doing that to like kind of let it let people know that it's possible right and people tell me all the time i don't know how you do it i, say, I work really fucking hard man <laughs> that's how i do it right like it's you know it wasn't like a gift or like a magical key that i was given you know like i faced adversity in my own way you know i was born with a rare congenital birth defect i wasn't supposed to live 20 years i mean there's you know, i was told by the head of pediatrics like a few years ago there's no medical explanation as to why i'm alive right like nothing has been easy but it's all been beautiful right and i've been grateful for every gift and like the more pain I've been in is the more it made me appreciate not being in pain. Right? it's like, it's like having a toothache and you're like, man, yesterday I didn't even appreciate life when I didn't have this toothache because it's all encompassing. Right. So, uh, I feel like, you know, having a little bit of perspective is super helpful. So, so it doesn't seem like really this pandemic has kind of shifted your like business and you seem, maybe you're just like, you know, the duck that's like cool, you know, calm on the top and, and, you know, swimming super hard under the water. But it seems like, you know, your world at least is pretty secure right now uh, and you're just kind of staying the course. Is that an accurate, you know, description? 
I, I wouldn't be genuine if I told you that we didn't have any impact from the pandemic, right? There are some people who are behind on their rent because of the pandemic. We, and that's a real thing. And so we're able to weather that storm right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really small percentage, comparatively speaking, to the overall portfolio. But I mean, there is impact there. Um there's a gap between what sellers want for their deals and what buyers want to pay for their deals. Mm -hmm. And so that has impacted our ability to do transactions and acquire new units. And I think the only other thing that's out there is, you know, there's some people who were thinking about doing coaching with me that decided not to because they didn't know if they have a job or they didn't know their income was going to be impacted and they didn't want to stop They didn't want to start and then stop because they didn't think that was fair and they wanted to keep the money in the savings. Um, To those folks, that one, that stuff was pretty disappointing. And it was pretty disappointing because I don't ever get excited about anybody going through it on their own. I just, that scares me. I know what it's like and how lonely it can be when you're trying to get things done on your own with no support. And especially when you're going into a space that you've never been before. I call it walking through the desert. Right. Which is like, we're all in the desert right now. We're like, what is this? You know, Uh, it feels like we took the red and the blue pill, quite frankly. Um, plot twist. Yeah. And now I would imagine though that other people are presenting themselves as new clients, right? Though I, I would imagine that like, even though some people have fallen off, right. Cause I've been talking, you know, I, I kind of act like as a mini business coach to a lot of my friends. Cause I just tell them what nobody else is willing to tell them, you know? Um, and it's like, you know, you can't just wait on those clients to get their finances back because they might never. But like in the it, at the same breath, like there's all these people who have new industries and are making money and are completely overwhelmed. Look at like Instacart. I mean, that's a really big example, right? But there's, you know, online learning modules. Like there's a lot of industries that are overwhelmed and there's a lot of opportunity there and maybe just shifting, right? Or shifting who you, your target client is instead of waiting, you know, on those other people. But I, I definitely appreciate the... Um, because it is tough, man. I, I signed a lease for a commercial building in 2016 and um, no, no regrets, as I like to say, but uh, that was the biggest mistake I've ever made. You know, it was so much money. I wasn't making enough money to justify the expense. You know, it was a three story building. It was across the street from, you know, the iconic Howard Theater. I mean, it was legendary. I built a retail store, a recording studio, a podcast studio, and a live music stage. And we did amazing things there for the culture. And I was literally like falling apart inside. And I was uh, managing four Airbnb units and like cleaning toilets all day in order to be able to pay that rent. Uh, and it was actually listening to Tom Bilyeu's podcast, uh, Impact Theory, uh, listening to all these wildly successful people that were like, yeah, man, I was living in my car. Like I lost everything, you know, or, or people that were like, you know, your greatest mistake in business is knowing when, you know, not, not knowing when to fold them. Right? Like the greatest mistake you can make is to continue to do something that's not working. And I heard people say things like your greatest success typically comes after your greatest failure, man. So you just got to, like, you just got to power through it and get back up because there's so many rewards, like from all those lessons. Uh, and I was like, literally like, you know, like fanning out the sheets and just being like, huh, you know, cause this, this sure is how I work. And, um, and for me, I had a, a health scare and they thought I had cancer. Uh, and I faced my maker several times with spinal surgery. So I've, I've been that, you know, I've laid in the hospital bed, you know, knowing they're going to cut up in my spine and having that conversation with myself, like, yo, are you good? Like self, like if you don't make it through, you know, like, are you good? Are you good with who you are? No one's in the room. This is a kind of, God's not even there, right? Or whoever you believe in. This is like you and you in a room. And it was always like, I'm good, but I'm not done, right? And when I had, you know, this, you know, they thought I had cancer and I was super stressed. And I just thought to myself, man, uh, if they tell me I got six months to live, I was a little bit relieved. So I was like, oh, that's a big indication. I got to make some changes. Uh, but I thought to myself, well, shit, if I got six months to live, I sure as hell ain't doing this for the next six months. And then it dawned on me, if I don't want to die this way, I don't want to live this way either. And I thought that I was closer to that realization from my life's history. But apparently, I had even strayed from that in my effort to uh, support all these people and create these opportunities. I wasn't creating them for myself. And, and it, and it kind of took that realization to make those changes and take some of those bigger risks. And, uh, but I, I say all that to say that it was incredibly 
painful and lonely because I was the only one on that lease. And I was the only one like borrowing constantly and just going further. And even now, like I, you know, I was a hundred thousand dollars in debt when I formed Heartcast Media. Uh, it wasn't easy. And people are like, how do you do it? And I'm like, again, I work really hard, you know, and then I use what I have. I leverage my skills. And then I really dialed in on what do I enjoy doing? And that's always been elevating and amplifying voices. So instead of elevating go-go bands or local rappers or like the people that I really, you know, love and cherish to, you know, forever. But now I'm elevating like, you know, people who want to make the world a better place and have a bigger reach because I feel like I have a greater responsibility to this planet and my position on it. Uh, and, and it, and it just took going through the hard stuff, but you know, I, and I, I've been saying this, you know, when you form a nonprofit, you have to have a board of directors, right? There's all these people and they can't be related. And there's all these caveats to make sure that you don't like fuck it up basically. Right. The money doesn't get, you know, but if you're an entrepreneur, you can just go sign any lease and just bury yourself, you know? And in hindsight, if any one of my friends, with half a brain had read that lease, they would have been like, bruh, do not sign that thing. Do not, right? They would have, they would have been like, just for the love of God, do not sign that thing. But I didn't have that or I didn't feel like I had that. And I just made those decisions on my own. And so that's why when I meet people like you or I meet people like Maurice and I see people, I'm like, okay, this person has some life experience that I don't have. You know, they've been through some things. They're relatable. I need to keep them like, you know, maybe not as a board of directors or maybe not as a mentor, but just like as an advisor, right? And just trust the process that as I'm leveling up in my journey, I'm also surrounding myself with more people like that. And I don't have to make those decisions on my own. You know, I can, I can call them. Uh, and, and at the same time, they can call me, right? Like, you know, I launched this program with Gary V and, and Maurice is going to be a mentor and he's going to be a student. And that's why I love that dude. You know what I mean? Like, cause it, you know, we can all be mentors and students at the same time in life. And I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes you get away from that because it is such a solo journey, you know, nobody understands no, without you know. question, without question. Well, I, there are people that understand, but you just have to find the tribe. You, you got to find your tribe. Exactly. If you can catch them from moving around from country to country or deal to deal, you know, but uh, I, you know, I'm grateful for all those relationships and, you know, even opportunities to have conversations like this. Cause I think it's important for people to keep things in perspective, uh, especially right now. Right. And, you know, some of the greatest companies, you know, greatest is a subjective word, but, you know, Airbnb and Uber were created after the last recession out of necessity, right? It wasn't, it wasn't fancy. It was like, yo, I got this apartment that I can't afford. I need to rent it out on the weekends, or I have this car that I can't really afford. Maybe I could drive other people around and then I can make the payment. And now it's evolved into something completely different, which is a whole other conversation, but it came from necessity. So I'm really excited to see the innovation, you know, what happens next in housing and, and every, thing because I think that there is a shift coming. So I'm glad to know that, you know, there's people like you that are that are out here, you know, controlling some of these deals and and you know forcing their seat at the table to make sure that things are more equitable for everybody moving forward. Uh, because if we don't have a fair and equitable country, then you know we have uh <laughs> what we have right now. Hello. Look at the <laughs> life. Uh, and so I think we're all ready for that, that next wave. So I'm glad to know that you're, you're a part of that. That's grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to be here. And I mean, you probably don't hear it much, but I, I appreciate your vulnerability, right? I don't know many hosts that you, they usually bring guests on to get them to be vulnerable, but for you to be willing to share your story is, is inspiring. And okay. hopefully people don't uh, skip over that and say, oh, it's just Molly. No, I mean, that courage that you have to share stories like that and the struggles and the challenges um, there's somebody out there that's going to hear you and they're going to say, oh, well, she did it. So maybe I can too. Maybe I can too. Yeah, man. I mean, we just got to keep trying, right? What else are you going to do? Just roll over, you know? Well, but you're a fighter. You're a warrior. You've been through so much that you know that there's more for you and you know that things have to happen because if they don't, it would be a waste and there's no way that it can be a waste, right? Like we're here until our mission is over and you don't make it through those 
near death experiences unless there's something else on the other side. Uh, and 100%. you know, one of those. And it's crazy because, you know, you were you were kind of asking, hey Jerome, well, you know, what's wrong or what's going on? And so this time of year, so August 13th of 2005, I was in a head-on accident with a dump truck. Oh and God. I was trapped in the car for about an hour until I could get medevac. And then I was in ICU for three days and so on and so forth. And every year around this time, I get blue. Right. It's kind of like, oh, whatever, you know, everything is kind of OK, very Eeyore. Right. Instead <laughs> of who and, you know, I, I've been working to try to process that grief. And it's, I, I can still feel like some of the pain in my legs from my legs being broken and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like you got to be grateful for your opportunity to see another day and to make the most of it. I know back in December of 2012, one of my teammates from high school passed away Mm -hmm. and he was pound for pound, one of the best people that I've ever met in life, right? Just one of those salt of the earth guys who'd be willing to do anything and you could always count on them because he always kept his word. And it was just like, well, if he died and I'm still here, then I better make sure that I live for two. Right. Because, you know, that guy, if anybody deserved to be here, he deserved to be here. And so, yeah, I mean, when people start taking the fact that they have breath as a calling for them to go do the thing, whatever that thing is, the thing that's in their heart that they tend to bury because people tell them it's not practical or it's not reasonable or whatever else the dream killers will tell you. I'm here and they're responsible because they listen to this point of the podcast. Like, no, you're responsible for that. And all the stuff that you've been telling yourself as reasons why you shouldn't do it is bullshit, right? Like it's totally up to you to deliver that result because there's somebody that you haven't met who's counting on you to do that thing that you haven't done so that they can go do their thing. And you don't want to let the world down because you don't know who that person is who's waiting on you to do your thing. I mean, they could have the cure for whatever. Life, right. Yeah, exactly. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this, right, since John Lewis died. Uh, And, you know, John Lewis was like, you know, had his head split open on a protest and like walked with Martin Luther King and they like edited his speech, right, the whole thing. And then he lived a life of service and he changed and people revere him. But then people are looking at protesters in the streets right now as rioters. And I'm like, so what is the difference between these protesters and John Lewis? And I'm not talking about the extremists and the people setting fires to shit. Like those are a very small percentage of people. And it's like, that's a whole other like, you know, Alex Jones conversation that I'm not even going to tap into. But like, you know, there are anarchists and then there are protesters. And so, it, you know, like you said, the people who are still breathing life. And so maybe, just maybe this pandemic is going to breed this like like fucking ultra generation of freedom fighters. Right. And not in the, like that, I don't even want to use that word, but like maybe, you know, when, when we come out of this thing, right. Cause no one uh, is escaping loss. Like everyone before this thing is over is going to bury somebody that they love over zoom. You know uh, they're, they're going to have those realizations of like, I'm still here. And so what's next? So maybe as, as, as far as this pendulum has swung, you know, maybe it'll start to swing back and we're going to see this like resurgence of people who like really give a shit and want to spend their lives fighting like John Lewis did. And, and maybe this is what we needed, right? Cause things were not working. Right. Uh, You're a black man in America. I don't need to tell you, Uh, but there's a lot of people, a lot of well-intended white people, you know, who really thought, everything was cool and everything is not cool. And I think uh, a lot more people realize that now. So maybe, maybe what will come out of this is this new wave of people who are determined to create a better future and be that inspiration, not only for themselves, but for that next person as well. Um, Maybe there's hope for us yet, Jerome, you know? Uh, I, I know that there's hope, but at the end of the day, I mean, you got to do the best that you have with what you got period. Right. And if you can't make the most out of what you have, then I don't know what you're here for. And it's kind of radical, but if you're not using the breath that you have to make the world better for the people that you encounter, then you don't deserve your breath. Right. If it's all about you and it's all one way and you're not adding value to other people, then there's a whole lot of other people who have gone to the other side, whatever that side may be for you. It could just be in the ground and they could use that breath to make the world a better place. And I think the world should be better because we were here, not the other way around. 
Amen to that, man. I'm trying to figure out how to grow some food and build a house in the woods, man. I'm going to figure this all out eventually. But, um, well, Jerome, I uh, really appreciate you taking time to, you know, chat with me today and uh, have this conversation. It's been uh, really great. Uh, it's, I'm excited to, you know, ha- have the opportunity to learn more about you. And uh, we'll definitely, you know, include all your links and everything. And uh, what I'm actually going to do is try to push the production on this so it comes out before your event. Uh, and so, yeah, so we'll make that happen. So I'll let you know ASAP, uh, and we'll put the links to that. And then of course, if there's any way that we can support you with your content after the event to make, uh, snackable, digestible content from that to fuel your content bank for the rest of the year, let me know because that's what we do. Um, but even if not, I still uh, am happy to support the event and I'm sure that we will have more communications. Uh, I'm excited to see. I can't wait to be able to move around again. So maybe we'll, we'll be able to see each other face to face, but this was a pretty good uh, you know, interim point for sure. My kids love the beach and my parents are about an hour away from you. So we actually go to that beach pretty regularly. Yeah. Well, and you know, what I've realized is that after uh, like August, September, well, September is like hurricane season, but then like October, November, December, everything down here is really, really cheap. Yep. Like really cheap. And so it's yep. actually possible. So I'm talking to some friends from DC. I'm like, dude, just come up here for three weeks or a month, rent a spot. It's just kind of like Zen back out, man. Cause there's something about, you know, uh, coming from the city and then being here and looking out at this wide open horizon. It just constantly reminds me all day long that there's so much possibility and there's so much ahead of us uh, and mm-hmm. to not lose sight of that. Awesome, sure. awesome. 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 Well, thank you again. Um, I will sign us out here. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the lower third podcast. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend with me and Jerome today. If you found this content valuable, please consider sharing it on LinkedIn and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have the links below for Jerome's events and how you can reach him. Uh, he sounds like an amazing person to be your coach. I'm sure he would be open to that. So let's get some business going. Let's, uh, let's, you know, dr- let's, catch some dreams right and uh, let's make it happen Uh, thank you again Jerome Uh, I wish you and your family all the best and I look forward to uh, to the next one this was awesome Molly thank you for having me yeah thank you excellent